you guys what's up hope everybody's doing good out there today welcome back to a special hour-long edition 45 minutes hour long however it turns out to be on jerk bait fishing i'm going to give you guys so much juice here on jerk baits you guys are gonna get you guys are gonna get 50 years worth of jerk bait experience here in this seminar and uh, it's taken me decades to learn it's taken me thousands and thousands of days on the water and uh i'm gonna give you guys a lot of good information eat an hour can't even cover this would this would be how so that's why i do on the water lessons with jerk baits is that there's so much instruction to that that um, you can only touch the foundational elements an hour but i'm going to give you guys a, a lot of good information in this video i think you guys will really enjoy it so uh get someplace comfortable and and hope you guys enjoyed the the, the presentation here real quick before we get started here Sort of like uh, one thing I'd like to ask everybody in, is in exchange for giving up all this information is a couple of different ways you can help support the channel here. A lot of you guys regulars know this already, but some of the best ways you can support the channel are hitting the products tab. You know, the little says, thing that says view products at the bottom of the screen. If you click on those, the channel gets like 20 cents every time you click on one of those. Um, if you guys go to fishingmoment.com, <clears throat> We offer lake map breakdowns, virtual fishing lessons. I'll include the link in the description for that. That's a really good way to help the channel. And also you guys are know, you know that I work with bait works and boat works here in Springfield, Missouri. If you're looking for any fish and tackle, boats, whatever, block at old school jigs, all the jerk baits that I'm gonna be talking about today are available at bait works. I'll include the link in the description to that. Um, and also I'll include the solar bat link in the description. If you guys are interested in some of my signature series sunglasses, link in the description. And finally, anyone that's interested in the on the water lesson with me, just shoot me a private message at my Facebook page or any block of professional angler. There, <laughs> got the plugs in. <clears throat> okay, guys, we're going to get into this. Now, jerkbait fishing, man, it's my favorite. It's, I'm going to say it's my favorite deal. I mean, I like flipping and jerkbait fishing or without a doubt, my two favorite techniques, but I got a special place in my heart for jerk baits because I've been doing it for so long. And um, I was fortunate enough to grow up in the Ozarks when the the entire jerk bait deal got started, you know, back in the seventies. I was fortunate enough to get hooked up with some local old Ozark experts back in the late seventies that taught me a lot about it. And I was fascinated with the technique and I sort of, I sort of took it under my wing to try to master the technique. And I'm not bragging here, guys. I'm not saying this. I'm just saying it a matter of factly because I put in the time for it. I don't think there's probably any, I don't think there's another bass angler out there that has got more hours than I do fishing a jerk bait. I mean, I've just, I've done it for 50 years. I have on the water lessons with it. If I'm fun fishing, I do it. tournament fishing. I, I just, you know, I've just got a, a lot of dirt time with it. So I, that's, I want to, I'm going to share that stuff with you guys that I learned here. Okay, first of all, this particular video, we're going to gear it towards the cold water technique of jerkbait fishing. Now, jerkbaits are going to work throughout the year, and there's a lot of different aspects to it that I could cover, like, geographically in different times of the year. Because jerkbait fishing uh, on a natural body of water, say down south in Texas or Florida, is going to be different. It's going to be different on like northern smallmouth. It's going to be different on different species of lake. But I'm going to try to gear this specifically to more of like the man-made impoundments um, in the cooler weather months. Traditionally, like from November to early April, that is when people associate jerkbait fishing with jerkbaits. That's when probably more people fish a jerkbait than anything else. And there's a lot to it that we're going to get into. Maybe at some other point we'll get into like. How to fish a jerk bait in warmer weather months or maybe smallmouth specific or natural bodies of lake but we're gonna we're gonna keep it for you know what i think that is the biggest percentage of jerk bait fishermen out there okay first of the thing there's there's a couple different elements that we're going to really get into i'm going to focus on like the type of areas you need to look for for jerk bait fishing you know like the conditions all that type of stuff and then we're going to get into the jerkbait specific, the lures and the colors and the retrieves. So right off the bat, before we can really get into the lures, I want to start with the areas that you want to look for, for the get into all the details as far as 
the type of water you need to hunt for it. And when I'm doing this, I know a lot of people have started started adapting live scope with jerk baits. I'm going to leave live scope out of it because, for the most part, the guys that are live scoping with jerk baits, they're fishing for individual fish. And I'm going to show you guys and I'm going to tell you guys about what to look for as far as geographical structures to throw this on. So let's. I'm going to start out first. We're going to go into water clarities to begin with, in relationship to a lot of different things. Water clarity is a key element in jerkbait fishing in the, in the cooler weather months. And it's going to surprise you because you, a lot of people associate jerkbaits with like clear water. You don't necessarily have to have clear water to catch them on a jerkbait. You can, I like to have, say, a minimum of like a, a foot and a half, about like that, you know, foot and a half of visibility, something like that. Um, and there's no maximum to it. It can be as clear as you want to have it. But for the most part, ideally, I like to have that the water visibility between three to six feet. Three to six feet is the optimum color, the water visibility, to get the best jerkbait fishing in the cooler water months. Now, you could, like I said, and there's different sides of that. Because, for example, one of the lakes that I do on, on the water lessons with, Stockton Lake up in Missouri, there's parts of that lake that, you know, you've got... 15, 18 inches of visibility, and I still catch them all winter long up there. But for the most part, that three to six foot zone is going to be key. So the lake that you have, start hunting that visibility first. That's going to narrow the lake down for you. So start identifying the part of the lake where it falls into that three to six foot visibility there. It doesn't really matter the species. It can be largemouth, largemouth spotted bass, largemouth spotted smallmouth bass. Um, all lakes have a variation of that. Very few lakes have just largemouth. Most lakes have some type of a, a mix in there. And the, the best jerkbait fishing, for the most part, are going to be on those lakes that have a mixed species, like all three species in them. Not, not that you have to, but that's, the, that's what really makes a good uh, jerkbait lake is those type of things. So once you've identified the water clarity, the next thing you have to do is identify the structure that you want to look for, the areas you want to look for. Now, a lot of this depends on how your lake is uh, set up, you know, how, how it lays out and the type of lake that you're fishing. Now, for example, if you're fishing a lake like Table Rock here in Missouri, it's a highland reservoir, you know, you've got a lot of mix of different various angled banks, you've got bluffs, you've got steep banks, you've got gravel banks, you've got flat banks. And if you're on a lake like, say, Lake Eufaula in Alabama, it's going to be a flatter lake. You're not going to have those type of options. So the fish are going to position differently within those areas. Also, the geographical area that you're in has a lot to do with the weather and the water temperatures because water temperatures throughout the winter time can vary tremendously. And that water temperature has a big part to play with the type of areas you need to look for. For the most part, um, I'm going to guess that most water temperatures throughout November to April and most of the lakes we have across the country range from, you know, 40 degrees up into in the 50s somewhere in that, in that range there. We get water temperatures down here in Missouri in the upper 30s quite commonly, 37. Well, I fish a lot of 37, 38 degree water in the winter, <clears throat> where if you're fishing, <clears throat> say, for example, down at Sam Rayburn in Texas, you may be looking at you never get below 50 degrees. You know, 50 degrees may be, your, may be your bottom there. So the type of structure that you need to look for has a lot to do with the geographical location of, of the lake that you're fishing and the water temperature. Here's what I like to look for first as far as the migration of fish. Now, when you're talking about early fall, early winter, now we're talking about November when those water temperatures are starting to get down to the lowest point. <clears throat> say they're say for example they're in the 60s and they're getting down in the 50s um, in November December like that. One of the first areas I like to look for early in the winter time are main lake points and main lake steep banks. Those are going to be the two primary areas that I look for. And the angle doesn't really have that much much you know variance on it because you can you can't get too locked in on the angle some sometimes you can run down the lake and you can catch one off a steep point you might go down the lake another mile 
and you might catch one on a flat point. But what happens is in the early winter, a lot of those fish that are moving it out to the bank closer that have been suspended out in that open water during the fall and the summertime, that's one of the first areas they go to is they migrate to those steeper banks and points and they're gonna sit there and stage a little bit in and around those type of areas. And the depth that they're in is really dependent upon your water visibility and your water temperature. If you have a lake that is on the bottom end of that water visibility scale, like we talked about, <clears throat> say it's in that two to three foot range, you may have a lot of those fish that are setting up, you know, in that three to six foot of water, even in, you know, in early winter time, um, especially if that water visibility is in there. And then if you've got, you know, water's a little bit clearer, so you've got, you know, eight to 10 foot of visibility, you know, those fish can, you know, be out just a little bit further. But what you have is in the early winter time, you tend to have small wolf packs of fish and individual fish. The fish haven't started to really group up that much. So you rarely in early winter, like November or December, pull up to like to one point and catch like four or five fish off one point. It's usually one on this point and you get another one on that point. The fish are in that process of grouping up a little bit. But for the most part, in the month of November, early December, I'm running main lake structures, you know, fan casting the points. I'm getting on the steep banks and the bluff banks, and I'm making long cast parallel down with the jerk bait, trying to target sort of that three to 10 foot zone. Now, as the water temperature begins to fall and you start to get it where it bottoms out, like in the coldest part, because like, for example, here in Missouri, our bottom out temperatures are in the upper thirties. If you're fishing down a little farther south, Yours may be in the upper 40s, whatever. But there's a transition that the fish make when that water temperature starts to get to its coldest point. And you would think that they would want to be closer to deeper water in the main lake, but that's not what I have found. One of the things that I look for, like in January, late December, January, early February, middle of the winter, is I like to pick out two or three of the major creek arms, the biggest creeks in the lake, and I get in those major creek arms and I start fishing the secondary points within those creek arms. Now, to me, it doesn't, a lot of people say that didn't really make sense, Randy, because bass are in the creeks in the fall. You think they'd pull out to those creeks points in the wintertime on their way out. I haven't found that to be true. It's almost like the fish, a lot of it could have to do with the, with the bait fish being that deep or moving up into the creeks. For example, here in Missouri, we have bait fish in the middle of the creeks all winter long. But my primary target areas in the coldest part of the winter is those secondary creek points in those major creeks. And also some of the steeper banks, but not as much as in the early winter. What I usually like to do is I usually like to get in those major creek arms and I fish the point itself and maybe 100 feet or 200 feet down each side of the point. And those fish can... They can either be on the end of the point or they can be on the inside parts. One of the things you'll find is every point on a creek has got a place where it's steeper and flatter. And usually the inside part of a point where it goes into a cove off of a creek has a little bit sharper angle. And a lot of times that's where those fish are going to be setting out there. Now the depths that they use, it depends again on what we just talked about with the water clarity and it depends on cover too. If you've got a lake that has standing timber in there, a lot of those fish are going to relate to the standing timber tops, however deep they are there. And the same with the water clarity. The, basically, the dirtier the water, um, the shallower those fish are going to be. But one of the things you're going to find out about wintertime jerkbait fish, and as far as area, this is the time of year when the fish school up in the biggest schools. And I don't, I'm not talking about big schools, but very seldom in the wintertime will you catch a bass and just catch one of them off it. A lot of times, you know, if, if you catch one, you're going to catch two or three off of that same point. And um, I think Sage is, let me take a break here, guys. Sage is barking like a maniac. I'll be right back. Sorry about that, guys. We got our neighbors have got two dogs and they start barking back and forth all the time. And so he's really hectic with that. So anyway, at the coldest part of that, back to where I was saying the coldest part of the winter, I'm in those creek arms. Now in late winter, like we're talking about, say, February into March and maybe early part of April. Um, one of the things that you'll notice with those jerkbait fish a little bit 
is they start getting off the points a little bit more and they start moving more to the banks off of the points. And one of the places I'm looking for there is I'm still in the creek arms, but I, I go farther down the bank from the points. So say in the winter time, I'm, I'm dead on the points. In the pre-spawn on the jerk baits, when the water's still cold, a lot of those fish will start moving further into the coves with the creeks and they're still suspended. They're still out off the bank, but they're not setting out there on the end of those points. They're starting to make their way back a little bit farther in the coves. So I may work, I may start at the point, say in February or March, and I may work back halfway back into a cove. Um, same deal, just targeting that depth that I feel those fish are at. But those are the main things there. Now, if you're fishing, well, I'll briefly touch on some other type of lakes here. If you're fishing a lake that has, a, say, more of a ledge lake, like, you know, some of the T Tennessee Valley River lakes, some of the lakes uh, in Texas that have grass, that type of stuff, that's a completely different type of situation there. A lot of those fish, like on the TVA lakes or your more riverine lakes, those fish are going to be shallower. They're, they're almost going to be in that zone where you'd fish a crankbait. Say, for example, if you're fishing a... If you're fishing Lake Chickamauga and you're throwing a, a, a crankbait on a channel bank or just a bank in a creek and you're catching some fish, that's the same type of areas you can catch them on a jerkbait with. Jerkbait fishing in the wintertime on shallower river type lakes, you use that jerkbait almost the same way you would a crankbait in the same type of areas. You're not, you're not concentrating those deeper suspended fish like the highland reservoirs. And if you're fishing a lake that has grass in it, I don't care if it's Texas, you know, Alabama, you know, Florida, whatever, you're basically concentrating just on the vast grass flats, fishing that jerkbait over the top of the grass. Toledo Bend's another one. You don't necessarily have to be on the edge of the grass. You can just fan cast water, fan cast areas over the top of that grass. And it's a really good way to catch some big ones. Some of the biggest fish I've ever caught in the wintertime on jerkbaits have come over the top of grass. It's one of my favorite ways to catch them with that. Okay, that's pretty much the areas. Let's get now into uh, the specifics more on the on the baits, techniques, and retrieves, and that type of stuff. The first thing that I'm gonna do with it is I wanna talk about colors. Colors with jerk baits, guys, are, there, there's not another lure category out there that's more critical as far as colors and jerk baits. There's, one of the one of the things the mistakes I see with a lot of anglers they make out there is they they've got two or three colors they use in a jerk bait and that's all they got. I mean I've I've looked through a lot of guys' jerk bait boxes and they just got a handful of colors. You guys you can't do that. I'm not sitting here trying to sell you a bunch of mega bass lures or jerk baits. What I'm trying to do here is you have got to be able to key in on that right color color makes everything because a jerk bait is a sight bait. It's a visual strike bait. And the color makes a huge difference on getting the fish to either look at that bait or commit to that bait. One of the things that you will, more true with a jerk bait than anything else, is bass will study a jerk bait up close, especially when it's cold and you're working that bait slow or stopping it. They will get this far away from that bait and they'll look at it from all sides and they study it. And a lot of times it's a combination of retrieve and color, but a lot of times just a slight variation in color, it could be the belly color side or whatever, makes a huge difference. So we're gonna get into colors and how to pick them with versus the water clarity and the sky conditions. When you're talking about jerkbait colors, you have to think in terms of three different types. Don't necessarily get locked in to one specific color. You've got three types here. You've got the flat finish that is uh, just what it says. It's a matte finish. It's a solid color. It's not reflective. It's not metallic. You can't see through it. Just a flat finish. That's one. And then you've got your translucent, which is a see-through. They're clear and you can see through them. And then you've got your, your metallic finishes, just the metallic side on them. Those are the three colors. Now there are color variations within those three elements there, and you can pick out your favorite there. But for the foundational uh, information as far as choosing this, here's what you have to remember as far as. The times that you want a flat-sided jerkbait or a matte finish is on cloudy days 
or low light conditions or times you've got a little bit dirtier water maybe not necessarily all the times but the main thing low light conditions on clouds if you if you're fishing out there and uh, you got you know it's windy it's cloudy early in the morning you know rain and that type of stuff this is going to be the best color for you there's something about a matte finish that puts off a glow in the water that the fish can really target in on this is something nobody's ever told me this this is this has come from 50 years of me spending thousands of days of fishing jerk baits the next with the metallic is the metallic works good on those sunny partly cloudy days that have wind you got to have that combination of them now not every now every one of these colors i'm not you can catch fish on them any day of the year but what i'm talking about the the maximize i'm trying to maximize the efficiency when they work the best the metallics work best on like i said brighter days with wind on it this is going to generate a lot of strikes not and water clarity can be anything it can be dirty clear whatever that's going to be a good color and then your translucent colors which are sort of the see-throughs are going to be really good in the clear water clear or clear or water and those days that don't have much wind and you've got some type of bright sunlight conditions partly cloudy sunny skies that type of stuff that's the foundation the foundation gives you a chance to start out with something because one of the biggest questions i get with jerk baits is people say you know what color do i need to use or they people know that i'm with mega bass and if they want to order something bait works it's like randy give me give me a list of colors the the colors out there like i said are relative to just how i described it there that's the foundation you can build on and for example on a matte finish there may be a dozen different colors of matte finish just pick one out that you think looks good i'm not there that's the thing about jerk baits i'm not i i can't tell you it's like use this Tabor rock shad pattern under these conditions bass fishing is not that absolute bass don't read books on that but you have to have somewhere to start out so this gives you a good foundational element to start with as far as where to begin with. Now, the water clarities, when you're talking about colors with water clarities, a lot of it has to do with the, here again, this is a hard one to talk about because different water clarities have different tints in them. Some water, some water, say for example, you can have four foot of visibility, but there can be like a tannic color to it, like a blackish tannic color. For example, if you're fishing Lake Toho in Florida, you can have four foot of clarity, but the water looks black. And then if you're fishing up at Lake St. Clair in Michigan, you can have four foot visibility and it's got that aqua blue. And then if you're fishing my part of the country, it can have a greenish tint to it and still be four foot clarity. So the tint that you have in the water also dictates the color too. So ultimately when you get that, it's a matter of experimentation. When you're talking about choosing the right color, you take in consideration the water clarity, you take in consideration the sunlight intensity, and then how the fish are reacting to the bait. Ultimately, you have to let the fish tell you what they want. Now, say for example, let, let's just, I'll start for an example. Say, say I'm going to Table Rock Lake the first part of December, and it's cloudy out, and you know it's a little bit windy or something like that and everything is set up perfect for a jerk bait. I may start out with a Tabor Rock Shad and say, for example, I'm not catching one and I, and I roll through some areas where I've traditionally caught a lot of fish in. The rule that I have with that, if, you, if you're in an area where you think it's a good area and you think there's some fish there or you've caught fish there before, give the color a try for about 30 minutes. And if you don't, haven't got a bite on it, make a color change. Just make, a, make some type of a switch. Say, for example, I fish the Tabor Rock Shad for 30 minutes on a couple good areas and I don't have a bite. Then I might just pick up the metallic just to give it a try, just to see. Or I may pick up a different variation of the Tabor Rock Shad and give it a try. But you've got to keep switching up. You, there's, and we'll get into different things you can switch up. But the first thing that you switch up on a jerk bait, if it's not working, is the color. So that's sort of a, a broad thing with that. In correlation with that, the next thing that you want to switch up on is if you've tried the color and you still can't get them to go on the color, the next thing that you have to do is you have to adjust your retrieve or your cadence on the bake. 
I've always talked about, if you guys have seen before, the jerkbait fishing, it's the, it's the most difficult technique in the world because you've got so many variables. And by the, by the time this seminar is over, you'll understand what I'm talking about, about the variables. So if you've made a color change on your jerkbait and you're not catching them, you got to change up your cadence. you got to change up your retrieve. Normally what I do is I'll start out with a jerk, jerk, pause, jerk, jerk, pause. That's what everybody does. And if the fish are biting and they're aggressive, then that usually catches them. But sometimes you have to experiment with that. Instead of using the jerk, jerk, pause, get it down there and maybe do jerk, 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 three pauses, you know, jerk, 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 um, and stop it and vary your length that you're stopping and then maybe jerk it once after that, then jerk it three times, then jerk it once. Try to vary your retrieve. Try to make your retrieve a little bit dis different until you can figure out how to trigger that strike. A lot of it also has to do with the, with the distance that you pull. A lot of guys, one of the biggest mistakes I see when they work a jerk bait is they, they overwork it. It's like they're bam, bam, bam. A lot of times when you're fishing one and when you get that bait down, instead of like trying to get that thing to dart everywhere like that, just barely twitch it. Just like move it where it goes just like that and let it stop or go just barely, barely move it. Because what happens is the colder the water, the less action that the fish want on a jerk bait. So a lot of times what I'll do is say in real cold water, um, I'll get it down there and I'll stop it. And then I'll just barely start reeling it through the water, just like that. I won't even jerk it. I'll just start reeling it with a steady retrieve. Because if you've ever watched a minnow in cold water, they don't dart around like this. They're just swimming super slow, just like that. So a lot of times I've caught a lot of good ones, you know, just reeling it in like that. But the point is, is you gotta experiment, you know, with your retrieves on that. Now, when you're talking about retrieves on a jerk bait, there's the the times that you catch a quality bass on a jerk bait, you got you got a very small window of your cast that has potential to catch a good one. Ninety eight percent of the bass that you catch on a jerk bait that are big bass, they're quality bass, is gonna come when that jerk bait is at its deepest part. So when you make your cast out there, you know, your jerk bait, the first quarter part of your jerk bait, your jerk bait's attaining its depth and then it gets to its maximum depth and then it starts to come up as it gets closer to the boat. The maximum depth that you have on your jerk bait is not that long. It, the, the, de the distance that your bait is at its deepest point is dependent on the length of your cast. Therefore, that's one of the things that I always stress, guys, to my when I do my on the water jerk bait lessons, is you've got to make a long cast with your jerk bait if you're in a situation where those fish are at their maximum depths. Now, if you're fishing like what we talked about on some of the TVA lakes or the grass lakes like that, this isn't that big of a deal because you don't a lot of times you don't have to maximize the depth out of it. But in traditional cold water jerkbait fishing on most man-made impoundments, you need to get that bait as deep as you can get it. And that depth is, that depth comes from distance on there. And that not only comes from distance, but it comes from how you work that bait on the way down and how your equipment is set up. So the first thing I'm gonna tell you guys, and if you guys have seen the channel, or if you've been on a trip with me before, is Stop throwing your jerk baits on a casting rod. Most people do. I can tell you guys right now, if you, anyone out there, if you would come to me on an on the water lesson in the middle of the winter and you've got a bait casting rod and I've got a spinning rod, you are going to get waxed. I will wax you on that spinning rod. Or if you had a spinning rod and I had a bait casting rod, you're going to wax me on that spinning rod. A spinning rod is the tool that you need for a jerk bait 95% of the time. <clears throat> the only time I don't use a spinning rod is if I'm using a big oversized jerk bait, you know, like the Mega Bass Kanata or that, you know, the big, big giant jerk bait. All the other times I'm using a spinning outfit. The reason that you have to get comfortable and have to switch to a spinning outfit 
is you can make a longer cast with a spinning rod than you can with a bait caster, especially if it's windy out there. There's no comparison. Uh, I remember I convinced Aaron Martins of that years ago when we were fishing at a, a, a jerkbait trip on, on Stockton Lake. You can cast 25% further with a spinning rod than you can a bait caster with that, especially, like I said, you're, if you're in a 15 or 20 mile hour wind, because jerk baits are notorious for catching wind. I mean, they they cast decently, but they still catch a lot of wind. So a spinning rod will allow you to maximize that cast. The next thing that a spinning rod does is the very essence of the way a spinning rod is designed with your guides hanging underneath is you can get a feel and you can get a sensitivity and you can manipulate that bait on a spinning rod in a way that you simply cannot do it on a bait caster. One of the things that you have to understand in cold water jerkbait fishing is you have to coax those fish into biting because it's not as a re it's not a reaction strike like it is in warmer weather. The big fish that you catch on that jerk bait are going to come, like I said, when the bait is its deepest part <clears throat> and you're barely moving it, just barely moving it. You're not going to catch many big ones darting this thing around in the winter time. It's going to be just barely moving, keeping it in one spot. And with the spinning rod, it's almost like crappie fishing with it. You can finesse it out a little bit because a lot of times, you know, I'll throw it out there and once I get it down to its maximum depth, I'm just barely twitching it. Just I'm talking barely. Sometimes I'm just slow cranking it, not moving them, and then I'll just pull it a little bit like that, barely crank it. There's an aspect of the finesse on a spinning rod that you cannot duplicate on a bait caster. You just it you just simply can't do it. So if you can take anything away from this seminar today, the one, the most important thing that I can tell you guys is to start using a spinning outfit on your jerk baits. I use the all the time for my jerk baits. I use that Mega Bass uh, Whip Snake spinning rod. It's a six foot eleven inch rod. Six eleven is the perfect length for a jerk bait rod. Six ten, six eleven. If you go to a seven footer or longer, you lose your feel. But you do, it. You don't have the same snap with it. It's too long. And if you go to shorter than 610 or 611, it's the same thing. Get you a rod that has 610, 611, medium action. You want, a, you want some type of a medium action tip on it <coughs> because that medium action tip will allow you to get that correct ma manipulation out of it. On top of that, guys, the next thing you have to do is, like I said, don't even think about using braid to fluorocarbon on a jerk bait. I don't use it for anything. You guys know that. Use straight fluorocarbon and you gotta go light. Most of the time in the cooler weather months, I'm using six and eight. And the six and eight depends on the lake I'm fishing, water visibility and the conditions. If I wanna maximize the depth of that bait and get it down to absolutely the deepest part, I've got six pound test Seaguar and Vizex on. I can cast that, I can cast six pound test line a freaking mile on a spinning outfit you can't cast six pound test on a bait caster so you're you're not going to be able to attain the same depth that i can out of the spinner rod so and you can land giants on it i, I caught a 37 pound striper on a jerk bait on six pound line before you can catch big fish on it get comfortable with that six pound line is my preferred size of line to use in the in the cold weather months and I will use eight if I don't, if I'll, I'll use eight pound test if I don't feel I need to get that bait at its super, super maximum, or if I'm fishing around some type of cover, or if I'm fishing a lake that has a lot of big ones in it. Say for example, if I'm fishing over the top of some hydrilla bread, over, over the top of some hydrilla like at Lake Sam Rayburn, I may go to eight pound test. But, um, so I'll use it 50-50. If I'm fishing a clear water lake with not much cover in it, <clears throat> I'm using six pound test almost all the time. So I can't reiterate how important that is because when you're talking about a combination of um, the color of jerk bait you're using and the cadence of jerk bait and the line size and the lure manipulation and the cadence, every element of that is critical to tie together because sometimes if you don't have all that working together you're never going to get a bite you may 
you may talk, run into some guy and say, man, he, he may say, man, I fished a jerk bait for three hours today and never had a bite on it. That is because he didn't hit on those elements. He may not have the right color. He didn't have the right cadence. He didn't have the right pound test line. He wasn't manipulating the bait the best. Not that, not to say that you have to have all those at one time coming together, but that's how you really dial in and have those awesome days on the water. Usually it's, it's usually there's one element more important than anything else. Usually it's the, maybe the color or the way that you're working the bait or something like that. But, and I, I wish I could sit here and tell you that this is how, this is what you need to do under this situation. I wish I could just have a list and say, work the bait like this here, work this color jerk bait under this situation. But it's not really like that. <clears throat> it's just a matter of experimentation a lot of times. One of the things about that too is you can't be afraid to experiment because even myself, as even as much experience as I have jerkbait fishing, I still learn stuff all the time. I learn stuff from guys that fish with me that I may not have tried. They may try a color that I've never considered. They may try a retrieve I've never considered. And sometimes it works. So don't underestimate your own ability, like your own creative, your own ability to be creative with a jerkbait with that. Just experiment a little bit. Okay, let's talk about, we're going to talk about jerkbait specific profiles. As far as jerkbaits, uh, um, the exact ones you want to use here. Now, you, you guys know that I use Mega Bass 99% of the time. <coughs> The only time, the only other, the only times I don't use Mega Bass is one percent of the time. I may use like the old Spoonbill Rebel. You guys, this is you guys heard me talk about this. This is this is what I lost the giant fourteen pounder at Tabor Rock on. Caught tons of giants on this. I still use it sometimes. Very very occasionally I'll use the Magnum Rogue, but guys, ninety ninety eight ninety nine percent of the time I'm using nothing but Mega Bass. And most of the time, I'm using the Vision 110, either the straight Vision 110 or the silent model. Now, the the silent 110 and the uh, regular 110, they're the exact same profile. The only difference is um, the 110 has a balancer here in the middle that actually moves like that, which uh, gives a little bit of noise. And the silent 110 has the uh the uh, weights affixed in one spot what makes it silent so if i get a situation let's say it's super tough fishing the it's bluebird skies post front the fish are skittish that's sometimes when i like a silent bait where it doesn't make much noise on it i will use that but most of the time i'm using like the 110. a lot of guys what they do and this is one of the things you found out in bass fishing now is there's a ton of guys out there but, um, but all they do is use the uh, deeper lift ones. Let me get this off of here. Should I have this out here really? How in the world does that get hooked like that? They'll use the deeper lift, the 110 plus one or the 110 plus two. The reason that a lot of guys use this right here is because they use bait casting outfit and they can't get the bait the same depth. I can get the bait deeper with a 110 on a spinning rod with six pound test line than somebody throwing the 110 plus one on a bait caster with 10 pound test line and the difference is the action the action is a little bit different on this as far as the way it works in the water and a lot of times they may want one better than the other times but that's just one of the things i found out now if i use the 110 plus one on a six pound test line on a spinning rod I can get this thing another three feet deeper than what anyone else have. I, on six pound test line, on a long cast with this 110 plus one, I can get it down into that 12 foot range, easy with the thing. So you're getting down there into a the depth that you can't hit it. But think in terms of, the, the first thing you need to think in terms of is lips on there, you know, as far as the depth attainment that you want to have. Now that depth attainment, it all, it has a, it has everything to do with how deep that you think the fish are. And that a lot of it has to do with water clarity. It's, you know, you can pretty much count on the fact that the deeper the fish are going to be, it's because the clearer the water or the brighter the conditions. So you may want to adjust your, you know, approach with that. The profiles that you have on there have a lot to do with it too. 
One of the things that I do a lot, and I've done a lot the last few years, is I've gone to the more of the finesse styles. Like this is the Mega Bass 110 Plus 1 Junior. You can see the, the size difference on it here. It's about, you know, probably overall almost an inch shorter. It's just a smaller profile bait in general. And one of the things I've noticed that during the coldest part of the winter, when those water temperatures are maxed out, they like a smaller bait. They like a smaller jerk bait. So try using these more finesse type jerk baits when that water temperature is down in the 40s. You'll get a lot more bites on them and you'll you'll still catch good fish on them to get you'll get a lot more bites on them the times that i like the bigger jerk baits the larger ones are during the pre-spawn the most of the time i'm using like the traditional four and a half inch one like the mega bass 110 uh during the you know early winter time i go to the smaller ones you know like the one 10 plus ones during the uh, warmest part i mean excuse me during the coldest part and then um the as it gets as it gets uh closer to the pre-spawn god i should have got all this stuff out here prior guys i'm going to show you i go to the biggest jerk bait of the year during the pre-spawn which is this mega bass 110 lbo I'm pulling out here and the reason i do that is during the uh the pre-spawn the shad are the biggest size that they're going to get all year long and this is the 110 plus 1 LBO. You can see the size difference between the two. This is a big bait. And when that water temperature starts to climb up into the 50s, like the low 50s, you're going to find that you're going to catch more and bigger fish on the bigger jerk bait that in, under those conditions where you can't hardly get a bite on them in the middle of the winter. It's like if I threw the big jerk bait when the water temperature is 40 degrees, I'm not going to catch many. But that's just a matter of, you know, the fish changing, the fish personalities changing a little bit with it. Now, hooks with the thing, we'll talk a little bit about them here, too. Um, the stock hooks on the Mega Bass here, these are the stock Mega Bass hooks that come with it. Now, these are really good hooks. Don't get me wrong. These are good stiff hooks. They're light. Um, but the one of the drawbacks with these things is once they, they bend pretty easy because they're fine wire. So most of the time what I do is I replace these after they bend out with um, three number five Gamagatsus on the front and uh, on the front and back and a number six Gamagatsu, all G finesse trebles on there. So I've got two fives and a six on there. And what this does is this, gonna, this is going to make that bait sink just a little bit. This is what you want, guys. You do you really don't want your jerk baits to suspend perfectly in the water. A lot of people that fish suspending jerk baits, they've got this idea in their mind that they that you got to leave it in place for 45 seconds without it moving. I haven't found that to be the case. I find that I catch more bass on a jerk bait if it's sinking rather than suspended like that. And there's a couple different advantages to this. First of all, I think that in the cold weather, your minnows as they're dying, they're tending to sink. They don't float up or they don't stay the same place. They tend to sink. And also, as the bait's sinking there, you can get this bait down deeper. If you count a bait down that's sinking, you can get it uh, you know, 20 foot deep in, in no time at all. But I don't like to keep my bait stationary. Even in the coldest part of the winter, I always want to keep it moving forward. Now, it may not be moving forward very much. I may just, you know, be reeling it or barely moving it like that. But I'm always, like, keeping it moving like that. I think one of the one of the biggest misconceptions of bass in the wintertime or in the cold weather months is they're super lethargic and they won't move and they just, they're not going to, they don't feed very much. I remember back when I started bass fishing, people, a lot of people th thought you couldn't catch fish in the winter time. And if they did, you had to fish like a super slow with a jig and, jig and eel or something like that. Bass are a lot more aggressive in the winter time than you give them credit for. So overall, I think one of the biggest myths in bass fishing with jerk baits is you have to fish slow for, and have to let them suspend for a long time. The only times that I've found that that is true a little bit are there two situations. If, you, if you're if you fishing a body water that is on the bottom end of the water visibility, say it's fairly dirty, the water is like closer to two foot and it's really cold, 
yes, at that time, I like the bait to sit there and suspend more because those fish, they're not relying as much on a sight bite. They've got to, they've got to get honed in on that bait for, from some type of vibration or water displacement. So that's one time I don't move it much. And the other time is so I'm fishing super cold water and I'm trying to put the bait next to a piece of cover where I'm trying to draw the fish out away from cover. Sometimes that'll work. I also have noticed on some of the lakes that I fish that have grass on it, if the water is really, really cold in those grass lakes, sometimes you can get bites by letting that bait sit there a long time. <coughs> and um, it'll pull those fish out of the grass to actually bite that bait with it. So um, those are some of the really key elements with that. But um, without getting into a lot more detail specific on this thing, um, that's, I, this is just sort of a seminar to give you an overview with that. As to refresh the high points of this, I'm gonna reiterate some stuff here to let you guys take it with it. If you can take anything away from this seminar, this is what's gonna help you the most. Number one, most important thing is get you a spinning rod. Put your bait caster away. You're gonna catch way more fish with a spinning rod. Learn to back reel. Don't use your drag with it because those fish, a lot of times in the winter time, they're gonna get, they're gonna nip. They're gonna get one hook in there, and by back reeling, you can put a minimal amount of pressure on it. Don't trust your drag. Don't listen to the crap you hear about drags. Learn to back reel with a spinning reel. Number one. Number two. Go light with your line. Try to stay six to eight pound test all the time. It's going to give you a lot more bites with it. Number three is get that bait to the deepest part that you can get it and keep it there as long as you can. Your strike zone or what I call the sweet spot is usually anywhere between five to 20 foot long, depending upon your cast. Keep it in that range and that's when you're going to catch your big fish. And finally, you know, spend a lot of time experimenting with colors. Use your colors and change your colors based upon the, the sunlight conditions, the water visibility, the overall light conditions that you have on the lake. And these things are always changing. One of the things you're going to find is that the, the light intensity and everything along with that at 9 o'clock in the morning is different than when it is at noon or at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So that's why one color that you're using at nine o'clock in the morning and you're catching fish on, it may slack off and you may have to change colors like in the mid part of the day because this, the sunlight angle and the sunlight intensity is different. So just keep experimenting all the time. Jerk bait is a matter of experimentation. Just again, try something for 15 or 20 minutes. If it didn't work, put it down and try something else. And um, those are just some of the high points that's really gonna help you guys out. So. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, anybody out there interested in booking an on-the-water jerkbait lesson with me and taking uh, booking trips right now, you can shoot me a message on my uh, Facebook page, private message, Randy Block, a professional angler. And again, thanks for tuning in, guys. Much appreciated for this. I'll keep doing these. Shoot, your, shoot me your comments. Uh, let me know what you guys think of this format. And uh, like I said, we'll be back with the regular video soon. And much appreciated your time. See you guys.